Mrs. Warren, and all the members of the Warren family, the President of the United States, distinguished special guests, and all friends of Chief Justice Warren. First, I wish to join with Rabbi Fine in expressing my own deep and heartfelt condolences and sympathy to Mrs. Warren, to all the members of the family. And it seemed to me that today, the verses in the Psalms which expressed best the aspirations in life of Chief Justice Warren are in Psalm 72. He will free the poor man who calls to him and those who need help. He will have pity on the poor and feeble and save the lives of those in need. He will redeem their lives from exploitation and outrage. Their lives will be precious in his sight. Our beloved former Chief Justice Earl Warren believed that the life of every man was as precious in the sight of the government and of the law as it was in the sight of God. That belief was the lodestone of his life, private and public. It directed his decisions in the manifold public offices he held, Attorney General and Governor of the State of California and Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. He subjected government policy and law to the test of conscience, for he always centered his attention on the human rights involved in the case. He related principles to persons, not to legal abstractions. And because he believed that law floats in a sea of ethical principles, he judged the Constitution also by his conscience, his set of ethical principles. This controlling viewpoint shaped his character and made him the attractive, unpretentious, gracious personality that helped our country to pass through one of the most tumultuous periods in its history. He had opponents to his views, but never any personal enemies. Thus, he was able to reshape largely our society, to have a victory for the neglected without having any vanquished, to vitalize the American dream for those who were losing hope in it. Fortunately for our country, he learned as a young man the differences in views among people. And fortunately for our country, at the age of 17, he worked as a railroad brakeman. This experience, of which he was very proud, taught him the need for the protection of the rights of the struggling wage earner. And this experience, as well as his family training, as he told me on several occasions, gave him a lifelong sensitivity to the rights of the minorities, particularly the Spanish speaking, with whom he dealt so largely in California, and the blacks. He thought of all men as his equal, never in a paternalistic or condescending way, but as a man living with other men and women in the one human family. Now, I remember particularly a chance conversation with him shortly after he came to Washington, which seemed to me to epitomize his philosophy. This conversation occurred after the Pan American Mass held in St. Patrick's Church, of which I was then the pastor. And one of the most lovable aspects of the Chief Justice was that he was also always so very candid. And I remember that the Chief Justice and Mrs. Warren always came to the Mass to show their respect for our Latin American neighbors and friends. He always stayed for the reception, and his geniality radiated throughout the gathering. So during the dinner, he ventilated his ideas about racial justice. The integration crisis was coming to a head, and the ideas he expressed then were included in the famous decision, Brown versus Board of Education, which integrated legally our society. He knew what his conscience told him 
about interpretation of the law. But he labored mightily to infuse his own warm-hearted and charitable convictions of the equality of man into the legal decision to win acceptance by as many as possible. You know, it seemed to me it was always like a good pastor. It's not sufficient to be right. You need also to lead people. And he was always conscious of that. He strove to make a community of equal men, to make the human race into a family under God, to make human society a place where God's greatest creation is recognized as a man fully alive and fully free. His regard for the dignity of every man turned a perfunctory event into a very pleasant human encounter. For some years, it was my pleasant duty to extend to him an invitation to attend various events. And he'd always say, you'll know that I'll come if I can. I believe in developing friendship with our neighbors, and that's the reason why I accept your invitation to the Pan American Mass and to what we call the Red Mass. He said, we need them, and besides, I like them. And once he remarked about our neighboring nations, you know, they'll teach you a good lesson when you need it. I remember when I was governor of California that I was unconscionably late for a meeting with a high dignitary from Mexico. I had some urgent business to attend to, but I was wrong in not keeping the appointment on time. The next time we had a meeting, that dignitary was just as late to the minute as I had been for our other meeting. By George, I knew he was going to do it, and I had it coming to me. We became good friends. That incident seemed to me to be typical of his life. He knew when he was wrong, and he proved his greatness by admitting, admitting it whenever the occasion demanded it. He had an instinctive kinship for every man, as evidenced in the famous decisions in which he participated. But this concept of the equal dignity of every man was responsible for his very attractive humility and utter lack of pomposity. He was never embittered or surprised that others differed with him about his judicial opinions. That was their right, and he was not so conceited as to think that he could convince every opponent. He acted on the principle of a predecessor, Chief Justice Vinson, who used to say that 50% of the people who appeared before his court thought that he was a great man. And Chief Justice Warren showed his balance and even temper in the face of even scurrilous criticism, as Rabbi Fine very appropriately noted. I remember that after the integration decision, I once asked him if the criticism bothered him, and he replied also in his very candid, homely way, every dog has got to expect some fleas. There was one point of law which did arouse him, and this was prompted by his great love and devotion to the members of his family. He was very strongly opposed to obscenity and pornography. And once when some example of obscene literature was showed to him, he said, I'd punch in the face any man who would show that to one of my daughters. No candidate for martyrdom for that type of freedom of expression ever presented himself as far as I know. And I'm sure that that football frame of Chief Justice Warren would certainly deter anybody from doing that. His belief in principles, his constant support of movements such as the world justice through law movement always gave him the buoyancy of those who live in hope. He was always youthful full of expectations that his country could give a brighter example of freedom under God 
a more convincing proof that free men can create a family of man where everyone is not only welcome but needed. He believed in the American dream. He incarnated that dream. And his hopes and aspirations were expressed, I think, by a student in this prayer. I hope that I will always be for each man what he needs me to be. That prayer epitomized the life of Chief Justice Earl Warren. And God grant that it epitomize the life of the country he so deeply loved and served so well. May he rest in peace.